I'm going to try to summarize not 40 years, but 39 years kind of being involved with these issues. And I'm going to try to do so by way of showing you just 10 projects uh, spread out over those 40 years and uh, six different companies that I'm actively involved with right now. That's the entrepreneurship side of this whole thing. So um, how I got started in this, and this was a story that Isla had asked me when we started talking a few months ago, was uh, in high school reading that book. And it wasn't actually an assigned reading. It wasn't. How many have read this book, by the way? Actually, just a two or three. So, did kind of, write? what's that? Did Al Gore write? He did not. He did not. <laughs> but if he had thought of it, uh, thought of saying that, maybe he would have. But I just wanted to read one of the quotations from the inside cover. It looks like any of the book you might pick up. It's not. It's a bomb. It can make the noise that wakes up the world. And what's fascinating to me is how long it took to wake up the world. The, the publication date of this is 1971. So here we are, all these, and there's almost not much that we can, no issue that we identify now. Actually, global warming wasn't that prominent in this, but other than that, all the issues, the concerns about air, about water, resource depletion, the end of oil, all of it's in here. And, and I, having read that in high school, that's kind of what made me think, oh my gosh, I'm interested in the built environment as an architect or becoming an architect this must be the most important thing about how I'm going to practice. So I came to Princeton with that preconception that that's what I was going to do. And as was mentioned a couple other times in talking to some of my classmates, it was interesting, in slightly different fields, but all of us who were kind of really interested in sustainability coming to Princeton had to work really hard to kind of cobble together in the 70s some classes that sort of gave us what we were looking for. And what a great privilege it would be to be here today with the PEI and all the other amazing resources. Um, why would I show this image? It, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, that This is the most reproduced image in human history, or others almost just like it, the blue marble. And that it was taken at all is almost an accident. Uh, NASA's obsession, of course, was with the moon and with space. And it was really only at the prompting of others Stuart Brand was one of them outside the program who said, hey, take a look back. It might be interesting. And, and, and when NASA did look back, finally, they were shocked themselves. There it was, our Earth, the oasis floating in space, so precious, so fragile, and seemingly so very alone. And I think many would argue, and I would agree, that this was, in a lot of ways, the most important impact of Apollo. Has anybody heard that? Yeah, 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 I think it's a common theme out there, and I agree. Okay, everybody remembers the 70s. And by the way, I did have that much hair then. Rich, Rich and Rosie <laughs> can vouch for me. They knew me when I had that much hair. So I was like, to show, I'm going to show you how I've changed uh, through those years, too. There's only one item in here that I want to highlight. We, we all know kind of the history, and I'm going to try to weave together some of the background of what was going on politically, societally, economically, as we talk about this evolution of sustainability. And the one I want to focus on was Jimmy Carter at the White House. And there he was, 1979, just three years after his election, who, despite being trained as a nuclear engineer, really kind of got a lot of things about sustainability and the environment. And he wanted to have a very visible symbol. So what did he do? He put solar panels. They were called solar panels. What they were doing was heating hot water, and I think they were actually heating the pool at the White House. I'm not positive about the details, but they were hot water heating panels, a solar thermal, we would call that today. So we'll kind of weave in the thread of what's happened at the White House architecturally, not politically, as we uh, go through this. So um, I went to Virginia, University of Virginia, for graduate school, got degrees in architecture and planning. And uh, I needed a little more money to put myself through Virginia, so what I did was started a company. And I had a carpenter friend, and he and I started designing and building solar houses. Because just as at Princeton, there still wasn't that much interest in the program. There wasn't a course I could take in how to design a solar house. But, but I wanted to explore what that technology was, what it meant. And of course, this is what a lot of solar houses in the 1970s looked like. I mean, I look at this now, and I'm, I'm kind of shocked, frankly. Is there, are there any other architects in the audience, by the way? Oh, that's a huge relief. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, OK. But yeah, architect wannabes. 
Actually, Neil was supposed to be here, so we'll see if Neil, a good friend from Darien, Connecticut, pops by. But this is kind of what they were. They were solar machines that you happen to try to live in. And they, in fact, did work pretty well. They uh, saved a lot of energy in terms of energy devoted to heating the things. Um, but they had a lot of other problems. Oh, by the way, before I, I tell you about the problems that these houses had, I have to mention, especially because we're here in Geo Hall, this University of Virginia professor was a geologist. And he actually was an ardent opponent of uh, tecto plate tectonics or continental drift. And of course, this is the building in which I had geology. Any of you who had geology probably had it here. And of course, Princeton, this building played a critical role in the development of that whole theory of continental drift, drift and plate tectonics. So we had some great arguments, he and I, and not about the house itself and solar housing, but, but about plate tectonics. And he had a lecture. What's that? I, I, you know, I, I'm, it was just the one class that I took in geology. I don't remember. Would that have been the likely? It was like one of them. Yeah, I don't recall. But this guy, he had a favorite lecture he used to deliver at UVA called Alice and Gondwana Land. So those of you that have a geology understanding, see, I got one laugh out of that one. So <laughs> Gondwana Land being the supercontinent, the, the precursor to our continents of today. Oh, uh, the problems with these kind of houses was that they tended to overheat. They were so good, so efficient at collecting solar energy, they in fact tended to bring in too much, especially if, as in this case, this client thought, well, this solar atrium isn't quite bright enough. I'd better add even more skylights on the top. Well, those skylights on the top absolutely guaranteed that this house in Albemarle County, Virginia, we have someone from Charlottesville here, don't we? You went to law school too, yeah, but don't we? You know, you're, you're learning Charlottesville now. So this is just a little bit west of of Charlottesville. And, uh, but this, will, this building did work pretty well. What I wanted to really show you is this. Architects love to do diagrams. And uh, this is the kind of diagram, these are the diagrams I drew for this house back when 1980 when we were building this. And um, we kind of had these things for the winter where we said what's going to happen is all this solar energy is going to come into this atrium and that's going to cause thermal currents to rise. It's going to drop back down. We're going to have that traverse this bed of rock, many, many tons of rock deposited into that crawl space. And, then, and at night, that's going to reverse the energy that was stored in the rock bed. will heat the house this way. And of course, in the summer, we, we thought that all the sun would be mostly rejected. Uh, a little bit would come in, and what little bit came in would drive currents up and out. And that would, in turn, suck cool, fresh air into these things we call earth tubes. Earth tubes are making a big comeback now, but those were earth tubes uh, way back, concrete pipe in the ground that went out into the forest a couple hundred feet. And, um, you know, we thought that was how buildings worked. And I think a lot of architects still do diagrams like this to this day. I mean, I guarantee you all the new buildings on campus have fancier versions of these same kind of drawings. And um, what I started to suspect, though, and maybe this is part of the Princeton training, is does it really do that? It seems kind of simple. And so after this was built, I, we did experiments. We started blocking off these airflows and the building worked the same. <laughs> what, what we figured, or what I figured out, was that we have a lot of preconceptions about how we think buildings behave, thermally in particular, but in a lot of other ways too. And in fact, most of those preconceptions, and many of them are ill-founded. Building behavior is far more complicated than we realize. And I started to, to rely on data collection and observation, kind of an empirical method of approach to building design, and less on my own preconceptions. So ask if you have any questions, by the way. Well, before I leave that one, there's one other story. It was kind of more personal. Maybe I'll go back to this, but um, because I mentioned I had a design build company, that was the first company I started, just the two of us. And we were building this. I was on the concrete crew, um, not well, pouring and placing the concrete for all the foundations. And the concrete truck was two hours late. And normally that wouldn't be a big problem, but of course that's before any of us had cell phones, right? Well, that was the day of my wedding rehearsal. <laughs> and there I am, and now we're out of Charlottesville, out of town. Nelson, but you can't leave. You know, anybody who's ever been in a concrete pour, when the trucks get there, you've got to have the manpower there to place that concrete. So not only was I late, <laughs> I was covered in some concrete on my boots. <laughs> so my wife, she's a wonderful person. I'm still married to her. That's the goodness. <laughs> so that was... That was an early indication for her that this whole sustainable thing was a significant commitment. <laughs> you know, in all seriousness. And, and by the way, I had never met my in-laws. 
That was a, they all flew in from out of state. So, great, good start. So yeah, it goes together. But um, as I was wrapping things up in UVA, I was thinking, where could I practice where I would have a better chance of trying to do some of this? And I still had the relatively naive impression of how buildings work. And I thought, well, I'll go where there's lots of solar energy and maybe some other things that are helpful. And these are actually some diagrams I have from my current work with the governor's energy office. But Colorado is fifth in the country in terms of the available solar resource, 11th in wind. We have tremendous amounts of geothermal that is geologic hotspots that we're starting to use to heat buildings. And we also have a lot of biomass, that's wood and uh, crop cuttings and things like that that we can use. So when you add that all up, Colorado is, in fact, a pretty easy place for me to be practicing and doing what I do. It's a great base of operations. See, so, but it wasn't too long before all that hair started to go. It was, I don't blame it on being in sustainability, though. It's just kind of what it is. And um, I don't have a picture of it. I could not find a picture of the event because I think it was done in secret. But again, 1986, what happened? The solar panels that Jimmy Carter put on, only seven years later, so at best a third into the useful life, probably less for most solar panels, were unceremoniously removed. Just like that. Not quite in the dead of night, but sort of. And, and I'm, I'm generally relatively apolitical, by the way, so it, it's not about that for me. It's really just what was happening and what was that indicating. And the other thing about the 80s, of course, well, if the 70s were a great time to be starting a practice in sustainability, the 80s were, for me, the disaster. The 80s were really a hard time to be trying to persevere with this. Uh, although the first couple of years were good. Really, when the bottom fell out was right here. The end of 85 is when the tax credits disappeared. And by early 86, gas prices and, and oil prices were almost back where they were in 1970, before the first energy crisis. So it's amazing how, how things went up and then very rapidly came back down. And that really changed uh, public perception of what we were doing and why we should be doing it at all. So I'm going to jump ahead several years. So um, by the 80s, I was working for a nice-sized firm in Denver, Colorado. We had opportunities to work all over the West and uh, designed a few justice centers. This is one of them in uh, Eagle County. So if you get in trouble in Vail, this, this is where you'd end up. It's <laughs> where Kobe spent a lot of time so in, in my daylighted courtrooms and very energy efficient. But um, when we did this building in the early 80s, it was still you know, possible to talk very openly about these energy objectives, all the things we're going to achieve. And the thing we really focused on with this building in particular was how to take the, the envelope. By envelope, I mean foundations, walls, roof, all the penetrations. Not just seal those up tight, but make that as absolutely as energy efficient as possible. So that's the kind of thing that we're uh, focused on and almost obsessed with in a building like this. See the beautiful mountain backdrop, by the way. And uh, in order to do that, this is kind of what really launched my um, interest in companies who supply the products to enable us to achieve our objectives. And I realized it wasn't good enough anymore to just specify the same products that we've been using. I had to actively go out and find the companies that could deliver new products to help us meet our objectives. So this building began, for me, a relationship that's still going, and a very fun one for all of us, by the way, because there's a Princetonian very prominently involved. But this is a way to do windows that's been available to us for 30 years, and there shouldn't be a window done right now that isn't at least as good as this. But just to make the point, a typical window, we, we measure insulation in this thing called R value. A typical solid wall, like, well, not this, this is a pretty bad wall. A typical newer wall would be, say, R19 or R20. So just, just to kind of think rough terms. Most windows out there are at best are two, two and a half. So most windows are a tenth as insulated as the wall that they are in. They're basically holes. They're not much better than open holes. Uh, these particular windows, and what they do is, between the panes of glass, they stretch this thin film of transparent plastic, stretched film. And it's coated, and we can have highly selective coatings and by doing this, I can have selective coatings on any one of those four surfaces. And I can tune the glass to a high degree of specificity. For example, in our buildings now, we have six kinds of glass easily, not just one kind of glass. But the, the number that you need to see is up here. These windows can go from R5 to R11. Now, not quite as good as the wall, but not a whole lot worse. And it really changes the whole game in terms of how we think about designing that envelope. And by the way, 
I was talking to um, the director of facilities here about this yesterday. So I'm trying to entice him to think this is technology that Princeton could go for. Think how many windows are on this campus. Wait, wait, there's a great graphic here. A simple way to summarize this, Amy Lovins, one of our Colorado pioneers, and his is another great book. Anybody know Amory's initial book? Soft Energy Pass. That's kind of another early one that I read that really inspired me. But that, that's still about right. In fact, I think we probably have more, more buildings, more windows, but when he wrote this quote just a few years ago, it was safe to say that as much energy goes out America's windows as was pumped by the Alaska pipeline at the peak of production. That's how much energy just literally goes out the windows, just because windows are so poorly designed. And uh, this company, by the way, I was telling you about uh, trying to get Princeton to use these. Um, they just got the contract to reglaze the Empire State Building. So their project involves, I forgot what floor it is, but they've been given an entire empty floor of the Empire State. Their fabrication shop is set up there. They're bringing windows out of the existing building, a window at a time, taking them apart, inserting that stretch film between the glass and reassembling it. So it's pretty cool. There's no waste at all. So if they can do that at the Empire State Building, how easy would that be to do here at Princeton? I think they're interested. He's, he's willing to take a tour with me over there. So anybody else wants to go along, let me know. It'd be kind of fun to take a look. I'm sure Robert Clark, our uh, alumnus from class of 65, would be glad to help us out. So by the 1980s, this is kind of what things were looking like. And this is not my building. I had to stress that. So even though I was joking about no other architects in the audience, I wouldn't want to be associated with this. But by the 80s, this is kind of what, <laughs> what things looked like. They, they had a bunch of active solar panels on the roof, just like the White House did. They had almost no windows. They were very compact. So you had a lot of spaces that didn't have any connection to the outside world. And that, that was kind of par for the course in the early 1980s. They hardly used any gas at all, but they inadvertently had actually very high electricity usage, but didn't realize it because the metric in these days was here, gas usage. The metric wasn't about electricity, so we tended to ignore that. The grid is kind of this infinite thing, and it's almost free. We're not going to worry about how much we're pulling from the grid. So the district that owned these uh, came to me at my other firm, my predecessor firm, and said, you know, we really like this building as a district. We built 10 of them or so. They... Um, they, they don't use much energy, they're economical to build, uh, they, they serve the education needs well. So we'd like you to meet all those criteria, but add one more thing that's missing. Could you make it a building where people like to be? <laughs> and it was stated that directly. It was, people don't like being in this thing. We don't know why. They're saying, we, the district, we don't quite understand why, what's going wrong. Now, they thought what they were handing us was this almost insurmountable challenge. We were like, We'll pretend it's hard, you're right? But we know the answer before we even start. We're going to take that building and we're going to break it down. We're going to take a compact form, we're going to extend it. We're going to connect it to the exterior world and use the natural forces of wind and light that are available and actually reduce energy. So this is the building that we designed for them. And in fact, uh, it met all those criteria. It used a lot less energy. Oh, one more point on this one. After a year or two, we noticed something else. The absentee rate in this building was half the district average. We thought, what's that about? So we said, Let, let's see all your demographics, because there's got to be something there. No, same, same socioeconomic status. What's driving it? So we concluded it was something about the fact that every room had view to the exterior and abundant daylight. Electric lights weren't turned on at all during the day. So we proposed to the district, let us do a systematic scientific study, because this is really worth understanding. And the response just totally shocked me. It was one of those moments when I realized I, I just didn't quite understand the world yet. And it was, that would be the worst thing we could do as a district. Because think of the inequity issues that would come up. How can we say to parents, we have a building at which academic performance is improved, teachers are happier, students are absent less, and tell the, the, the students in the other 29 or 30 elementary schools, you're substandard. We can't have that kind of situation go away and pretend and forget you ever even mentioned this to us. We don't want to talk about it. And that was the end of, of that line of research, unfortunately. So kind of we tried to get into some of that early on, kind of what we would now call post-occupancy research and evaluation, but kind of got stymied a little bit by, by a concern about what the research could show. And uh, the reason I, I stuck a couple of things in here, um, that project, though, that series of projects really kind of established my career as not just a general architect, but really 
focusing on environments for learning, schools, higher ed, daycare, preschool, whatever it may be. Um, I, I had such an enjoyable experience working on that series of buildings and, and just the, the process kind of really drew me into working on those kind of projects. So that, from then on, I've been about 85% schools and environments for learning. So you'll see that as a pattern. And that also resulted in, for me, a commitment to maintaining my lifelong learning, another, I think, strong Princeton trait that I know you all share, and, and also kind of being community service. So these are just a couple of my favorites. I've been a science fair judge for many years, and, and for fun, we have sponsored a solar energy award at the science fair. The first couple of years, I was lucky to get one or two entries. You know, I'm, I'm judging next week, so I'll see how many I get next week, but the last couple of years have been great. You know, now I'm getting a dozen or two dozen entries, and there's really a lot of excitement with the kids about doing that. Um, this other photo is kind of a fun one because uh, the IRS, of all people, whoever thought the IRS would become my friend, but they have. And, and they started this program called EPACT. It, it's an energy um, tax deduction. And what it does is in the public sector, it lets public owners transfer the tax deduction to those who design the buildings. Amazing. So I can get a tax deduction, and what I've worked out is an agreement with some of my clients, if, if they'll sign the paperwork to let me get the deduction, I'll fund a scholarship program for them. Talk about a win-win. So here's energy savings and efficient efficiency turning into scholarships for schools. So they absolutely love the program, as you can imagine. Okay, the 90s. Things didn't start too well in the 90s, did they? At least for the sustainability era. Um, maybe for some of you it's a little bit different, but things were still kind of slow, and again, we um, didn't talk about it too much. In fact, I should have said one last point here. I'm going to back up. I won't back up too much, but this is the last building where we talked about energy and sustainability. I finished in 85. So after that, when I would start to talk about that, my clients would start to glaze over and say, what is he going on about? Now that that nonsense of the oil crisis is over, this is irrelevant. You know, we really are not interested in hearing about this anymore. So that's kind of when I say we went underground. It was just about 85, 86. Uh, so, oh wait, was there anything else in there I wanted to talk about? Um, you remember all these events. Well, I think, you know, there are a couple of really great things. The Rio Summit and Kyoto showed that there's starting to be a global and even a U.S. awareness of environmental issues and that we do need to pay uh, a little bit more attention to them. Unfortunately, of course, the U.S. never did ratify Kyoto, and, and maybe there were some good reasons there. But if you look at the map of, of countries that didn't ratify, so it's a little scary. <laughs> All right, so this is an example of one of our underground buildings. We are still embedding in these things all the energy savings that we've done. And by the way, at this point, these buildings are using about half the energy of what the typical building of that era was. That's, that was kind of our typical target, get at least a half. But at this point, we're starting to explore beyond into what's happening with all the water on the site. So all the water that hits the roof is being channeled to areas where there are growing plants. There's no irrigation, which in Colorado, of course, is a challenge. So this is, we use the term zero escape a lot for, for, for plant materials and landscapes that can survive with no or, or almost no irrigation. And we really start to push hard about materials. So this is a locally quarried sandstone. If we move inside, we'll see all the beams and roof structure are a waste product called Paralim. That's just leftover wood strands from processing other materials recompressed and turned into beams. So those are the kind of things that we were starting to look into in the 90s. And uh, that kind of building took me into a relationship with another fund company called Calwall. They've been around a long time, founded in New Hampshire, still privately owned. Uh, their founder is a great guy, Bob Keller. He's kind of been an inspiration to me as an entrepreneur. He's 97 and still goes to work every day. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? He just, he just has such a passion for it. And he pushed this totally new version of their product. You've heard me mention our values before. Well, this product was somewhere, it's a fiberglass panel that's insulated. And there's some of it on the campus. That fiberglass panel used to be insulated to about four or five. Better than a window, but not great. Well, they have found a way to take aerogel, or they call it nanogel, but it's really 95% uh, air aerogel. And they have filled the panels with that stuff. So now that product is the equal of wall in terms of insulation. So I can get abundant light through this product and still have all the insulation of a wall. So we've been using a lot of this product, and you'll see it a little bit later on. I didn't bring any samples of nanogel. It's a little bit hard to handle. So that kind of takes us into the 2000s. They started a little bit slowly, but, but clearly we, we thought there was a lot of hope as we were getting going. 
in the 2000s. And I'll show you um, a lot more photos and buildings from this. But guess what happened at the White House? Woohoo, how about that? They weren't solar thermal, but they're PV panels. And, and frankly, they're all but insignificant. It's only a nine kilowatt array, which is tiny. But at least it's another visible symbol. Now, that didn't happen with the current administration. That actually happened in 2003. Very quietly, in fact. I don't know if George didn't want people to know that he was doing that or what. But, but by the way, George Bush's own house is amazingly energy efficient. Um, Gore's house has been in the news a lot, right, for not being very energy efficient. Well, uh, George uh, W.'s house actually is quite efficient. Uh, of course, we had the IRS starting that EPAC tax credit thing that I talked to you about. And the ERA bill actually is um, fueling a lot of the growth in our office right now. We can talk about that with one of the programs. And so in 2005, we got what I would call our first really dream project. Anybody know where this is? <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, I'm not on the current slide. Too easy. I needed to hide that. You guys are so smart. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so the Aspen School District. Oh, thanks. The Aspen School District came to us and said, you know, we're going to, or the town is going to be the greenest resort in the world. That, that's that town's commitment. And they can do it. And, and I admire a lot of what they're doing up in that town. And as we're replanning our entire school district, we need someone now who can keep up with us. And fortunately, there we were. And so uh, we were able to get this particular project and master plan the entire school district. And one of the things that came out of that, several projects, but this is the kind of the flagship, an all new middle school. And uh, we tried to do a few things really differently. We said, in order to make sure this works, let's go out there and I'll get a grant for a quarter million dollars. And I told them this in the interview. I'm, I'm sure I can get a grant as seed money to make this the most sustainable building you can imagine. And fortunately, I was a little worried about making a promise like that in the interview, but we were able to deliver a quarter million dollar grant. The other thing was, at this point, when we were starting this in 2005, there were only two or three LEED gold buildings. Does anybody know about what LEED is? Should I explain LEED at all, or is everybody okay with what LEED is? Okay. So, explain it? Yeah. Okay. Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. That is the countries and becoming the world's standard methodology by which to evaluate the greenness or sustainability, as well as energy efficiency, of any building. So there are lead programs for schools, for office buildings, existing buildings, industrial plants, a wide variety. And so, and there are different levels. So you go certified. It used to be bronze, silver, gold, platinum. But nobody wanted a bronze medal. It's too much like the Olympics, right? It's like a total bummer to get a bronze. So they changed that to certified and silver, gold, platinum. There still are only a tiny handful of platinum buildings in the country, but growing rapidly. But at this point, there are only two or three gold schools in the entire country and none in Colorado. So the other thing we did was went to the board in town, and we did this during the promotional campaign to pass the bond, and said, let's commit to lead gold and make it happen and do it right now. And I think that generated the kind of momentum the project needed to really see it all the way through. So getting that political buy-in was really huge. Oh, one last thing. Then that wasn't enough. We said, OK, this is Aspen. We have to do even better than that. What can we do? So we said, let's make it a goal that this building saves every year 1 million pounds of greenhouse gas. And that's in comparison not to the building it replaced, which would have been too easy, but in comparison to an equivalent sized brand new building that meets code. So let's be a million pounds a year under that. Now, I haven't quite got there yet. I'm at 900,000 pounds savings, but I'll show you how we're going to get there. Of course, when you've got an environment like that, it's easy to have spectacular views. It's just Everywhere you turn, it's unbelievable. I, I almost put in the view that shows, if you kind of pan this way, you would see the school district's own ski uh, mountain. <laughs> From the front door of the high school, you go across the parking lot to your own lift. Well, when you've got a ski team, you've got to have your own mountain, right? So that's how they get all their training in. Um, so you know, how do I get from 900,000 pounds saving to a million pounds? I've still got to do some renewable energy of some type. And for us in Colorado, most often that's photovoltaic. Not always, but most of the time photovoltaic. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about a company that I'm really excited about right now. And I've got, um, they're gracious enough to send me some of their materials. It's 21 Century Silicon. This is the, um, 
This is the, the uh, high purity quartz that's the basis for the entire, well, the semiconductor industry. You can pass around a couple of chips if you want. You know, um, give you a couple more there. That's kind of the basis for the semiconductor industry and the photovoltaic industry. And um, although there is temporarily a slight oversupply, most of the projections are that within a few years, as the economy rebounds, and I think it's actually already starting to happen in this particular sector, the, de the uh, demand will far outstrip supply. And what this company has done is found an entirely new way to take that material that I passed around and turning it into this. This is 6 nines purity silicon. This is good enough to use for semiconductors, but the purer it is, the better a PV panel it makes. So I mean, if you want to see what that is, it's more welcome to kind of pass that one around too. So they can do this now with something like one-sixth the energy input in less than half the time. What makes me so excited about being involved with this company, and we're their corporate architect, by the way, and as well as I'm an investor, what makes me so excited about this is that we need lower cost PV to close the gap from where we are right now to true zero energy buildings. And we're going to start to talk zero energy buildings next. This is the grand opening of their facility in Texas from a couple months ago. Uh, but before I go all the way to zero energy, uh, another really great opportunity we've had recently. This is a new series of elementary schools for a growing district uh, where we're doing one to three buildings a year for them in this plan. And fortunately, every year, we're able to make incremental improvements. So as we've been working on this building, we've taken the energy use from where it was to half to a third to a quarter. So that's typical for us, is somewhere between a half. That, remember, half is kind of where we were in the 90s. Now we're trying to get right down to 25% of previous energy usage in these buildings. And um, so now we're really pushing into slightly more exotic technologies. This is an ice storage system in the basement uh, that, that takes care of demand issues. Demand is kind of an electrical uh, grid supply issue. And the other really great thing, though, about these buildings is they're almost 100% daylighted now. So you've heard me use that term daylighted a couple times. I should define that. When I use the term daylighting, it is the replacement of electric light with daylight during the day. It's not just to have a window and not just to have daylighting in a space. For to make a difference in sustainability, I've got to have the electric lights either not there or turned off. And so we are rapidly pressing toward the point where every building, and I think it's only 10 years away, is not going to have any electric lights on during the day. And I mean any. And you'll, I'll show you why I feel like it's okay for me to say that soon. This is, an ele this is the classroom in this building. The only electric light on is the lamp and the projector. So what we have learned are ways to balance light from the perimeter, but very carefully filtered and controlled with products like Cowell or others that I've mentioned, and have light that's being piped now through the building from above, and sometimes piped a great distance. How do you do that? This is a basic technology called tubular daylighting device or solar tube. Sometimes they call them light pipes. So I can pipe light 30 or 40 feet through a building right now and have very effective output. That, that was a device that, would, that made this classroom work. That's what you're seeing right there. How does, how does it just mirror? How does it work? The whole key to it, and that's an excellent question, the whole key to it, because there were devices like this in the past and they sucked. They just, they sucked up light is what they did. And, and so even if you build this thing out of polished aluminum, you've got a reflectivity of maybe 0 0.95, 96. You go 20 feet, you've got no light output because the light is making so many internal bounces. Every time it touches that wall, you're losing 2%. Compound that to a factor of 10 or a factor of 20. So those earlier devices just, they were great ideas and they weren't working. What has really changed, a couple things, these are so much more sophisticated in their ability to gather and concentrate light, but the reflectivity has gone up to 0.997. Now you take that to a factor of 10, I'm only losing a couple of percent. So it's amazingly effective. So at, at the bottom of this tube that's 20 feet long, I've got almost the same light output I had in the first foot. And that's what's the remarkable question. Is there a heat with that? No. I can put a selective infrared filter right there if I want it. If, there are times I might want a little bit of heat, especially in our mountains or a colder climate. I can let that in, or I can block it. And there's no UV, uh, no ultraviolet also, or like 1%, almost none. 
So it's a really cool basic device. So we work with this company all the time. We're bringing them in on a lot of our projects. The building I showed you has 113 of these. That's what it takes to, to fully light a basic school. It's about, um, I think if you want to put one in your house, Mimi, or if you wanted to, for me. Well, I said because they make smaller versions for residential. Yeah. So a small residential version would be five to 600. The, these commercial size are about 1,000 installed. So I get a pretty good payback on that. If I'm turning off half the lights in a space all day long, I can pay back in a few years. And, and that's why, I mean, skylights are a pain, you know, and, and we, and in Colorado, they're, they're just death. We just don't want to do any kind of penetration on a roof generally. The thing about this, because the aperture is so small, it's a foot to two feet, it's one piece. So, you know, I've got um, more than a thousand of these out there on my roofs and I haven't had a leak yet. So they've kind of given me at least a little bit of confidence that I can put these in without much of a problem. Those are the two good questions. How do you get all that light, and how do you keep your roof from leaking? Because most architects' lawsuits are about roof leaks. It is that simple. So we're pretty low to put penetrations in that kind of vulnerable condition. By the way, I put some of these on Aspen, and I thought I was really smart, kind of lessons learned, right? I'm going to make them two and a half feet high because there's more snow there. Well, the first winter, they had four-foot drifts on that roof all winter, and a superintendent called me up really mad. We're not getting any production out of the solar tubes. What's wrong? So, so I said, go look at your roof. How much snow is it? Oh, well, they're covered. So, but she's still kind of mad at me. I didn't put like a six-foot high. <laughs> on. Like, you, you can't win sometimes, right? No, it's actually, they're, they're great for retrofit, surprisingly. The nice thing, a good question, see, they, they have a wide variety of flexible elbows, so I can thread them through almost anything. And they size them to typical joist spacing and construction. So, for example, you're in a house, the joists are either 16 feet, or 16 inches or 24 inches. You get a unit that fits one of those modules. So they've been really good as a company about figuring out the market. They've got a lot of retrofit work going. In fact, Macmillan Building, where facilities are located, retrofit three or four of these into their office. And they're really happy with them. So they, they've been prototype testing them for future use here on campus. We have take, I'll show a building, I'll answer that with, with an example. So before I answer that, I'm going to detour to one other project first. And this is another one that happened just a couple, well, when did it happen? I've got 09 on it. We got this job two and a half years ago, though. So Stone State Park is Colorado's first large scale, by large scale, I mean 4,000 acres park in a generation. It was planned in the early 90s, and the public hated it. It came out of the woodwork. The equestrians hated it. The neighbors hated it. They were the before fires. It was just a typical, not in my backyard attitude. So the state said, whoa, forget about it. And in 07, they said, you know, we can't just have these beautiful acres sitting here. Let's try again. So we went into that interview and said, if we pitch this to the public as a zero net energy park, the country's most sustainable state park, we think we can turn that around. So that combined with two years of public process, we got approval last week. How about that? Wow. We're going to build a zero energy park. How do you do zero energy in a park? Well, we're going to have a variety of, these are some scenes. I mean, it's just classic Colorado. You get rock climbing. There's a, you know, bears live there. You just all the wildlife that you picture. It's just um, a postcard for the state. What we're going to do is we're going to take the streams and creeks and existing dams, and we're going to build a little bit of micro-hydro infrastructure, just almost as a demonstration of a place where kids could come and see how hydro works. We're going to do a little bit of photovoltaic, because that's a natural for us. But the big issue is what's happening all around this park, not immediately around, but in our state. You've probably heard a lot about beetle kill in the West. It's, it's devastating. But in part, it's a natural phenomena. And it's certainly a huge opportunity. All of that is potentially fuel. The problem is how do you harvest it, how do you get it where it's needed. But those programs are rapidly being put into place where there is harvesting and pelletizing. So we're going to be able to use biomass just from within our park confines and all the space heating for all our buildings will be from biomass. So we're not going to import any fossil fuel of any kind to this park. And we have a way to do um, 
all the cabins and structures in the park with this technology we've patented or trademarked called Snug Cabin. So by carefully connecting the structure to the thermal energy rising from the earth, but then isolating it from the cool that penetrates into the ground at high altitude, I, and then having a super insulated envelope, I essentially have a thermos bottle capturing heat. And because the problem for state parks is they might have a structure that doesn't get rendered for two or three months, and they've got to heat that or condition it. So with this, they can turn off all the systems and let her go. And then when the occupants want to come and rent this, they throw some of those pellets in the wood stove, and they're up to 60 in half an hour. So, so they were pretty happy. But <laughs> I show you a preview. That wasn't enough for me. I don't like to go in interviews without an ace up my sleeve if I can. So I not only did that, I said, let's design the park in clusters. And let's put a ranger or two rangers, whatever you need, at each cluster. And service that complex by rangers on bicycles. And so what I did was called my good friend Craig Calfee, uh, a great entrepreneur in California, bike builder. He's building bamboo bikes in Africa for Africans. And I said, send me your mountain bike. So he sent me that mountain bike right there. And I stenciled the name of the park ranger on the top tube. And I wrote it in the interview room. <laughs> you got to be willing to cut loose, right? <laughs> I wrote it in the interview room, and I parked it where those guys could see it for the whole interview and made this pitch. It's zero energy. And by the way, I'll buy you that carbon, I mean, that bamboo bike for your ranger, which I will. So I walked out of the interview thinking, We've got this one for sure, because I could just tell. I, of course, I knew they were cyclists before I went in. <laughs> I, mean, I had that piece of information. It was, how do you act on that information? So, so part of it, at times, is how do you combine marketing savvy with sustainability? So and, but I just kind of wanted to throw this. I love this diagram. Vehicle efficiency. That's the most efficient vehicle in the world, bar none. Nothing comes close. And if it's bamboo, it's the lowest carbon footprint vehicle in the world. But here, here's, here's the scale, the relative efficiency. I love this graphic, kilocalories per kilometer per person. So one car, definitely the worst. A car with five riders, not so bad. I haven't figured out about the horse and a well, swimmer is pretty bad. But, but the train isn't great. There's a moped, a runner and walker. There's the bicycle. And here's our little carbon or bamboo bicycle. So anyway. That was just a little side, but this is a, a fun little company doing amazing things with, of all stuff, bamboo. And it's a great bike. I rode it around for a weekend. He let me kind of borrow it, so, which gets me to this. So I'm an avid cyclist. Maybe you figured that out by now. And uh, so I organize uh, rides for our Rocky Mountain Princeton Club, and we have our own official uh, Princeton cycling team jerseys. So any of you that are interested in cycling, plan on coming out and joining us. We've got our next event the first weekend in June. And it's a serious invitation. If any of you like to cycle. Where, where, do you, um, where do you ride? Well, Denver area, but we'll go out into the mountains. Or, or the ride, this was Elephant Rock, a well-known ride uh, south of Denver through kind of rolling terrain. And there are 50, 60, 100-mile options, whatever you like. You know, so. Anyway, so that, that's our team. So I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the, the elevation gain on the... Uh, the 100 mile ride here is about 4,000 feet. So it's, it's, it's no big deal. No big deal. I'm, I'm crazy, but I'm planning a 200 mile one day ride. So that's kind of my next goal. I, I, don't know, Sam, I don't know if I'll make it, but that's, that's what I'm starting to work on. This is my family, by the way. So, so we're all cyclists. Oh, and, and that was on my um, Calfee bike in that photo. OK, another really cool thing is uh, the governor's energy office. We're so excited about this. Uh, the governor's energy office, that's Governor Ritter, who's now lame duck Governor River, Ritter, but that's how it goes. Um, he wanted to start a program, and it's called High Performance Buildings Program. And they didn't have the resources to do that with staff, so they looked for a consultant. So they actually hired us to run this for the state. So for me, this is kind of fulfilling our mission. I can't design every building, and I wouldn't want to, but how do I have more impact? How do I leverage all these lessons learned from all these years? So what we're doing now is traveling the state. We're going to have almost a road show where we do workshops in little towns and in, in, in cities. We talk to local colleges, universities, libraries, fire districts, school districts, you name it. Any publicly funded building is eligible for our assistance. And I wanted to call attention, though, to this chart. 
because this chart, I could have almost started the whole talk with this. Why do I care about buildings and why do I think buildings are important? Buildings are environmentally, and that, however you measure it, you can measure carbon, you can measure energy, you can measure emissions. Buildings are almost half, well, 48% of the total problem. Most people assume transportation is bigger, or industry, or agriculture. Buildings and all the impacts of buildings are bigger than any of those, and almost as big as the rest of them put together. So my challenge, and I kind of willingly restrict myself to this, is how do I positively impact this half of the economy, this half of energy and emissions? So that, that's kind of our goal in our company, is to attack half that problem. And I figured there are all of you out there, people like Tom and others dealing with water with air, and we know those will be addressed too. Uh, well, I just one thing about the energy. Oh, yeah. Um, in the first buildings we do is that what we've observed is as we've made the uh, envelopes more energy efficient and tried to cut down our, our losses, mm -hmm. is that we ended up going to a point where we had this, quote, sick building syndrome yeah. in that yeah. everything started to concentrate inside because mm -hmm. we, in essence, had gotten too efficient. Yeah. And now we've sort of started going back in terms of uh, adding, in essence, you know, increasing the outdoor air making it a little bit less efficient. Right, right. Do you think we, you know, at a point of that crossing over, do you think we've uh, gotten to that point yet? Well, I think Tom brings up a great point, and, and that kind of was what I maybe meant to say with that solar house. That's kind of where that started. We sealed things up too tightly. And so when we did that, we sealed in all the contaminants too. And we exposed ourselves to all those. So there's no doubt that buildings got too tight. And the building codes have already kind of forced us to back off of that. You know, our, our ASHRAE, that's the society the government just kind of has pushed us into much higher air flows. And, and fortunately, there's an answer, and it's heat recovery. And so most of these buildings I'm showing you have heat recovery. So what I have to do is I have to bring more air in and more air out. And what I need to do is recover from that airflow either the heat that's leaving when I need it or the cool that's leaving when I need it. So heat recovery from being a really fringe technology is becoming front and center and becoming more important all the time. It's really, I think, our best answer. But there's one other piece, and that is there's a very strong movement back to what most people would call natural ventilation, windows primarily. So in climates where we can do it, and in ours we can get away with it fairly well, Jersey maybe, um, but we can do a lot more with windows than we have. And so I think we're going to see a strong resurgence of windows that can operate, partly in response to that concern over sick building syndrome. So thanks for that great question, Tom. So anyway, the, it, buildings are half the problem. That's what I like to make sure people understand when I have these kind of talks and, and why, to me, uh, I work so hard at this. So in Colorado, here is our total um, carbon footprint. So we've kind of done an analysis that every activity we can find happening in the state, as best we can, obviously it's it's only approximation, but it's our best effort to date to try to identify all the activities that generate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, convert them into the equivalent of carbon dioxide, and measure them. And this, the, the yellow bar is where we were headed. And in 19, uh, excuse me, 2005, this Colorado legislature enacted a climate action plan that's resulted about in a leveling out, which, which is remarkable. But of course, our goal, and what we're trying to figure out how to do right now, how do we not just level out, how do we actually return to the 1990 level, which is exactly the challenge that Princeton University has set for itself. How does Princeton get back to that 1990 level? And they have a chart that's almost exactly like that, remarkably reminiscent of that particular chart. That kind of captures the problem that we're facing and what we're trying to achieve. And of course, 1990 still isn't great. That's just, we've got to start somewhere, so let's start with that. Can we drive back to 1976 maybe? Would that, wouldn't that be a better target year? Oh, just a couple last projects, then we'll be done. Uh, so another thing that I'm passionate about is science education. You kind of maybe pick that up from the science fair thing. So we're, we've been really involved a lot with schools and this thing called STEM. Some, have you, who's heard of STEM? I'm just curious. Has anybody? Okay. Science, technology, engineering, math. And in the public school sector, it's becoming an enormously influential trend. And there are whole schools now being dedicated to STEM trying to get students who are excited and who have great, I mean, kind of making every school into Bronx science or whatever you would think of as a great science school. 
because what we're seeing is so many kids are coming out either being turned off by science, math, technology, or just not having an adequate preparation to pursue the career that they might. So this is a building that we're doing. What's exciting about it to me is it's going into the worst part of this district, the, the, the lowest performing academic part of the district. And they've said, let's use science and technology as a way to make students excited about their overall education. And we've even been able to do something. We propose to add a little lab right here, an elementary lab. So every elementary school kid in this district gets to come here at least once a month and experience science in a different way, to see something that they wouldn't see in their own school. So to me, that's really important because I think part of the problem that I faced all along and that you've faced in this sustainability is the public is so poorly educated in science in general and has such limited ability to engage in discussion or analysis of what are essentially scientific issues. So, I, so I'm really excited about getting kids to understand science better. Okay, now we're getting into some high-tech stuff. So in the middle of this building, I've got a new device. I can beam light eight stories now if I want to. So we've got this device called a Sundelier, and I'm on the board of directors of this company, by the way. So the technology, there's the sun. I've got a parabolic mirror. There it is, 12 foot tip to tip. That parabolic mirror focuses the sun's rays to a secondary parabolic mirror down to a plane mirror, another plane mirror, and vertically through that hole. The same size hole that the solar tube used, I can pump four to six times the energy, and I can still filter it as much as I want for infrared, ultraviolet, whatever I need to. And in fact, I've just got one filter taking care of all of the energy content. And then I can put a diffuser here that redistributes that light across a very large space. I could, I could light a room four to five times the size of this room with one of those. And I can do it, eight stories is easy. This, this dimension is already 93 million miles. It's the same beam of light. It's not dependent on the reflectivity of the tube. I don't even need a tube anymore. I can take it another eight stories easy. And I can have a little half mirror and pick off. I could take a little piece in that way to the toilet room or something, yeah. What's the difference with this one on a cloudy day and the other one? No production on a cloudy day. So. Marginal, so marginal, hardly. Wait. So this is a technology that's really assuming a limited market, but a very substantial market, not just the southwest part of the U.S. Think of the Middle East. Think of so many of the parts of the world that are predominantly sunny climate. So if it's not at least, say, a 60% sunny climate, uh, this is in the upper 50s here, then you probably wouldn't do this. But where you've got that sunny climate, it's remarkable what it can do. By the way, another reason I like to use daylight so much, beside all the psychological and biological benefits that you get, it heats up a building less than the same amount of electric light. Electric light is inherently hotter, even the best electric lights. So I get a secondary benefit in reducing air conditioning. So that's some of the things that we're using to drive those energy costs down, 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 and hopefully get to zero net energy. Okay, so this is the, I think, last project. Who lives there? That was going to be the question. A relative of mine. A relative. So you might have guessed that when my wife and I acted as our own general contractors and built a house, almost all the products that you've seen are in there. The only, I don't have a sundelier, um, and it would be kind of fun to think about that, but, but there are solar tubes, there's nano gel cow oil, there's serious materials windows, and all those companies with whom we've developed relationships, some of them are very close working relationships are represented there. So, and by the way, this is available for Princeton functions, Mimi. So we, we can host 60 people and uh, it just was kind of fun to take all those things and go back. This is the first solar house I've done since the one I showed you. So it's kind of fun to double back and say, okay, how can I apply what I've learned and try to get to a zero energy house? So this, the goal of this was to be the most sustainable house in Colorado. And in 2006, we did get an award as the most sustainable building all buildings in Colorado. So it was kind of fun to do that. And uh, that's, that's the backyard, but, um, and there are, <laughs> there are the other residents of the house. And uh, one of the things we really pushed again was materials though. I showed you that photo of all the dead pine trees. Well, it's a shame to turn all of that into fuel and burn it. There's some other things we can do too. So we made it a mission to do, this is beetle kill pine floors. Those are beetle kill logs, beetle kill doors, trim. So we wanted to use Colorado local products as much as possible. So we've got uh, a dozen or more products that are from right in that region, which is part of the fun. And I think an interesting thing about sustainability is it's going to drive building and architecture to be more regional again. 
That is, buildings in one part of the country will have a reason to look different from buildings in another part of the country. And I think architecture, that's actually a wonderful thing. It was a nice thing about the past, and I think it's something that modern architecture kind of lost, is that homogenization of every building, everywhere in the world being designed to look the same and ignoring where it lives. So um, that's where we are. So it's a house that is crisscrossed by sunbeams during the day. Oh, I guess I have another photo here. Um, Okay, sometimes it takes sustainability too far, my wife thinks. But then again, I was late for the wedding rehearsal, so she, she can't say it's a surprise. So sometimes when she sees me doing this, uh, I have ground-mounted photovoltaic panels. And there's a reason I ground-mounted them. I have plenty of room. And you can maintain them so much easier. They don't overheat as much on a roof, and overheating is a big issue in efficiency. And guess what happens when we get a little two-inch snow, and it's sunny the next day? I can go out there with my car brush, and I clear all the snow off my solar panels. I might have lost that whole day in that 20 to 25 kilowatts if I hadn't done that. But I'm willing to go ahead and before I go to work, clean them off. And actually, those are some of my biggest days because guess what? I've got a field that's a perfect reflector here, bouncing more solar energy. And it's also cold that day, so I'm not going to overheat it. So this is actually maybe my best day of the year, and I'm not going to lose it. <laughs> so, okay, I get a little carried away. But... That's the herd of elk kind of hanging out. Kind of, I don't know where they're traversing that day, but that's where it is. So anyway, we live in this house. We have this abundance of sunshine and daylight in view. And at night, I get light from another source. The source that's still distant, the moon. And the moon is my nightlight. I don't have any lights on in that house at all during the night either. We can kind of walk around. And that's it. Well, thank you. <laughs>